Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. Welcome to the Bikes for Death podcast. My name is Patrick, and I'm your host. And today, we're talking with Mark McGraw, who was the first and only finisher of this year's Grand Gravel 500. This is a race that I was slated to participate in, but with the coronavirus, it got shut down. So the official race didn't happen, but a few people did line up to do an unofficial go at the race. It was a bummer not to be able to participate, but it was great to be able to chat with Mark about his accomplishments this year. So congrats to Mark, and thank you for taking the time to chat with me. I have a couple announcements for you. First, I'm running a coronavirus sale over on bikesordeath.com. If you go to the store there, everything is 19% off from now until the end of the pandemic, however long it lasts, whether it's a year, two years, the rest of our lives, who knows? All you got to do is head over there, load up your cart with all the goodies, and use the promo code C19 at checkout and watch those dollars fade away. And lastly, if you'll take a moment to head over to iTunes and rate and review the show, it is greatly appreciated. As always, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know what? Let's just cut it out right now and get right to the show. Right to it. Right now. Let's do it. Let's go. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day or maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your bars, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You left that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes. All right, Mark. Uh, welcome to the Bikes or Death podcast. Thanks for hopping on the line with me today. Oh, hey, thanks for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. So I'm starting to do something uh, new kind of for fun is just a five question getting to know you round. It helps me and probably helps people listening too. Yeah, sounds good. Going to start off with just name, where you live, and what do you do for a living? Mark McGraw. I live in Hewitt, Texas, which is right next to Waco. I teach Spanish at Baylor University. El Espanol. Sí. I don't know Spanish. Man, that would be fun <laughs> if we switched this whole thing over to a Spanish uh, interview just on the dime. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I took German in high school. How old were you when you learned to ride a bike? Oh, man. I was a little late. I was probably more like um, seven or eight years old. I had uh, training wheels for longer than my peers and felt really bad about it and one day i was riding around the driveway and i and i realized my training wheels weren't really doing anything and i asked my dad to take them off and i was off to the races by the time i was about nine or ten my bike really represented freedom to me it was what enabled me to get around the neighborhood to go as far as the the uh, pet store and buy uh mice for my boa constrictor and that was, you know, for me, um, a big step into into freedom as a human being, just to yeah. get out and, and get on my bike. I relate to that so much. You and I would have been friends with the boa constrictor and all. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come into bikepacking with any experience in the outdoors? Yeah, I, I was in the Marine Corps for 20 years. I was an infantry officer. I'd done a lot of, you know, hiking and uh, involuntary, involuntary camping <laughs> in the Marine Corps. And, uh, I was used to being outside, being used to, uh, I was used to navigating and, uh, being uncomfortable and rained on. And I had a lot of that background and, um, I started doing triathlons in 1985, actually when I was in my last semester of college and bikepacking was kind of a natural marriage of those two things. Right. Yeah, I found I found the same too. It's like, oh, you can put these things together. Let's yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. And had you participated in any other bike packing races uh, before the Grand Gravel 500, or was that your first one? I had done um, I'd done gravel races. I'd done Dirty Kansas 200 and 
I'd done several gravel races in the Washita Mountains in uh, in Arkansas near Hot Springs, and oh, yeah. I had done the uh, the Delta Epic in Mississippi that a guy uh, named Jason Shearer puts on. Uh, that was almost 300 miles. Uh, great, great race, point to point in Mississippi. I'd done that a couple of years ago. Oh wow, 300 miles, you no know, camping. You're just doing it all in one go. Uh, I did stop and sleep for an hour and a half in the Delta National Forest. I had a bivy sack and a little air mattress. I took a nap on uh, a picnic table in the Delta National Forest. Other than that, it was a, a pretty much a straight rip. Okay. Well, yeah, so that was kind of a bike packing. That was a really uh, good experience to prep for Grand Gravel. Okay. And what? And kind of out of my depth if I had not had that under my belt about a year prior. A year and a half ago, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's good uh, to cut your teeth on one. I was actually looking forward to doing the Grand Gravel uh, this year. Um, I don't know if you know, but I had I had registered and signed up to do it. Actually, pretty late. I had a uh, podcast lined up that weekend, and it was a I don't really want to say who, but it, it was a kind of a big deal. Um, mm. And it fell through. Um, and so actually, because of the coronavirus, there was an event going on, and the person couldn't go come because of the virus so yeah, uh yeah. so kind of like last minute no training i was like well heck i can do the grand gravel now yeah, and yeah. i was really curious to see how i wanted to race against myself two years ago so two years ago i did it really a rookie didn't know what to expect uh made a ton of mistakes mm-hmm. uh, and this but this year i would have gone in with like no training so i was really curious to see how having the mental side down better, having learned some things, having talked to some pretty incredible people and learned from them, how that would carry me, even though my physical fitness really isn't where I'd want it to be. Anyway, I'll have to put that off for another year, but, um, I don't remember. Knowledge and experience (laughs) weighs more than just pure physical fitness in these things. You, you know, to navigate, to not waste time, to not, break your bike, those things probably count more than how much wattage you can put down. Oh yeah, I agree. I, and, but I agree with you in theory. And that was what I was looking forward to really testing out is that the mental side of it, knowing that I've done this before, I know what's coming. I know I can do it. Um, I know I'm going to do some things smarter. Um, but I didn't get to test it out. So we'll have to table that for next year. Hopefully you and I can line up. Yeah. Or tire to tire. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, So we are in an interesting time right now, obviously, with the coronavirus. Um, Mm -hmm. We should, I've been mentioning the dates on everything because this is progressing so quickly. I think that it's important to mark where we are in time as we talk. Um, So today is March 25th. It's Wednesday. And the race that you participated in was on March 19th. Right. Um, So... We're, I mean, you know, Brian Colossia, where I live and where the race started, just got their shelter in place order three days ago. Right. Um, so, I mean, we're really hot and heavy and everything's shutting down and all that. Um, and also worth mentioning, the Grand Gravel 500 official race was canceled. Right. Um, however, there was a grassroots contingent that uh, sprung up and it seemed like there was going to be quite a few people to do it. And then at the end, uh, only three people showed up and you were one of them. Yeah. Well, there was a question about what resources were going to be available out there. Right. Kind of, I think we could all see this window of opportunity closing down Mm -hmm. because uh, the policy was shifting from um, suggested social isolation or social distancing down to, um, kind of a mandatory hunker in place, nobody go anywhere. So we could kind of see this window closing and we didn't know how closed it was. So a lot of people were asking questions about, hey, well, these little convenience stores in Groveton and Richards and Elkhart and New Waverly be open, be open when we come through there. And that was a real question mark. I, I felt like they would be. And I did a little research. I called around to every store I was interested in and got an affirmative thumbs up. And I kind of caveated that with the question, you know, kind of saying, I know you guys can't, don't have a crystal ball. You don't know what's going to really happen in a couple of days, but do you anticipate closing? 
And they all told me, no, we plan to be open. So, you know, I felt like the window was still barely open to go (laughs) and do this thing. Was there any other factor or consideration with the virus that was weighing on you that you were considering, or was it mainly just the resupply? Not with the virus. Um, I felt like I was the safest place in the world was was East Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's lightly populated. You were going to go. I knew I was going to travel 127 miles without seeing anybody, without any support, without seeing anybody but dogs. And I so I felt good about being protected from coronavirus and uh, not not putting anyone else at risk from coronavirus. I, I felt like, you know, I was just in a such an unpopulated area at this time that I was very safe. And like I said, that that's a that's a window of, of opportunity. I, I feel different about it now. I would probably feel different about it a week from now. Right. At the time, I felt very safe in terms of coronavirus, uh, because I was absolutely, totally by myself nearly every minute of the 66 hours I was out there. 66 hours. You, you licked my time pretty good too. That's, that's a nice time. Ah, thank you. Uh, by the way, I haven't congratulated you yet, but uh, congratulations on being the first and only <laughs> finisher of this year's Grand Gravel 500. Thanks. I, it's an odd uh, distinction, but I, I, I'll take it. I appreciate it. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's odd. You know, the way I, I've always looked at it is, I mean, first of all, I think you had it harder than a normal normal year race. Um, you were out there alone, like you said, um, mm-hmm. with only a couple other people in the field. Uh, we can get into all how everything broke down in a little while, but ultimately you wound up there completely alone, not even anyone on the race course except for you. Yeah. Um, so mentally, you know, you had that going on. And then you also had, I mean, everything that's going on with the coronavirus. Yes, I, I see where you're coming from, but I would think it would still have to be weighing on you to some extent. I mean, the world's kind of crazy right now. And I think we're all to some degree, uh, feeling that pressure. Um, and then I always feel like, you know, you beat everybody that didn't show up, you know? So, um, yeah, my hat's off to you. I think you killed it. Well, I appreciate that. I, I feel very fortunate that I was able to, to go out there and race a lot of people because of their job requirements, uh, were absolutely, uh, shut down and unable to race. So I feel very, very blessed and fortunate to have had a little window of opportunity where I was prepped i was equipped my wife completely supported me going over there and doing it she knew i'd be abjectly miserable sitting around at home watching the computer (laughs) screen if i had not gone and done it and all those factors you know really took a lot of pressure off of me and i only live about an hour and a half from college station and brian and i always felt like if something really went south i could just call my wife and she could come over there and get me so for me it was very uh low pressure well that's good i think that is that is worth mentioning one reason that uh the grand gravel is so attractive to me is because it is right here i don't Mm -hmm. have to travel very i mean i just i go 10 minute drive and i'm at the start line Mm -hmm. um and if anything goes wrong that's how this year i mean i I was i was gonna go for as long as i could without sleeping um really Mm -hmm. push myself and and not really worry about finishing i was just like i'm gonna go out there and just see what would happen if I go all out. Mm-hmm. Um, and with the idea that, Hey, if, if I blow something up, I'll just make a phone call and someone mm-hmm. will come get me. You know I mean? It, it, yeah. take, it takes a ton of pressure off, uh, whenever it's like a local race like exactly. that. Yeah. Um, so I do, obviously let's get into the race, but let's talk about your training and preparation going into the race. What did you do personally to, to train, both, you know, on the bike and your nutrition as well. We got a question. Actually, David Kelly. Do you know David Kelly? I don't think so. Okay. Well, he he sent in a message on uh, Facebook. Uh, was curious about your nutrition uh, mm. going into the race as well. Well, the the training was really kind of two two parts. One is just kind of training the motor to handle the the demands of of racing that far and racing as fast as you can. And I just I follow kind of a a five day a week 
program where I have a couple of uh, hard days and a, a long day. Uh, I tapered down from that. I had events that set me up. I had a 100K gravel race in the Ouachita Mountains back in January that was super, super cold and hard. I had uh, a 24-hour time trial on a road bike in late February at Pace Bend near Austin. Mm -hmm. It was a really, really good test. Um, that was, uh, you know, helped me get stronger, helped me work on sleep deprivation, helped me work on nutrition, helped me work on being comfortable on the bike. And then I made three separate trips over on different weekends from Waco over to College Station. I rode parts of the course just to get familiar with the course and see what the what the gravel was like. Mm. Uh, I rode between Highway 21 and uh, Palestine and then back and uh, got a feel for the road, the gravel, the route. Um, the terrain. That's one of the harder sections, I think. I thought it was a, a fairly hard section. It was, you know, on the shoulders of uh, Crockett National Forest, um, some tough roads. Then I went out and rode from Palestine down um, towards Crockett right. National Forest, and um, that was right. a good test. And then on a on another weekend, when on a rainy weekend, I went and rode from Groveton north backward up the course uh, to Highway Seven, and then uh, back down. And that was some, that was mud. It was very muddy. It was not so <laughs> muddy that I had hike a bike. It was not so muddy that I had to scrape the, the, the mud off my tires, but it was muddy enough to where it got mud all over my seat bag and my water bottles, and it made me make some decisions about how to set up my bike. My water bottles that were on the frame of my bike, I moved, I, I took those off, and I went to a Camelback. So I went mm -hmm. from 50 ounces in bottles on my bike to 70 ounces on my back. And my repair parts that were in a, a, a an, un, an unbottle under my frame, they looked that bottle looked like it had, it had been dipped in chocolate. Mm -hmm. I said I'm this is a, this would be horrendous if I had to pull it out and try to re fix a flat. So that went into a Releve uh, Jerry can on my top tube. So I made adjustments. I changed my tires. I was running. Um, Panaracer Gravel King SKs that are normally great, great tires, but they seem to to cling to this sandy mud and fling it up all over the place. And they didn't seem to be very um, stable sliding around in the mud. And I changed those to Maxxis Ramblers. What and size? Uh, as big as I could run. Big as I could run on my Salsa Warbird. 45 on the front, 40 on the back. As big as I could fit. Okay. And that was... Yeah. That was a good choice because that was that did a better job of shedding mud, even though it fit tighter to my frame. So those decisions about e equipment, about dealing with mud, about just being being comfortable on the route, knowing, hey, I've seen this before. I know this part of the road. Those were all uh, very, very helpful uh, planning factors when I was out there in the race. When you were doing these uh, training rides uh, on the course, were you riding loaded? Yes, uh, that's as, smart. As, as close to as close to uh, race day loaded as I could. Wow, that's 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 a great thing to do, and uh, for people out there listening, that's probably a great piece of advice. Is uh, I did quite a bit of that as well. It's like, okay, this is what I think I'm going to need. Let's take it out there and ride with it. Mm -hmm. And I, I did some overnighters and whatnot uh, to to pre to prep whenever I did mine as well, and. Uh, it's a great way to figure some stuff out. I want to get in the tires. We'll we'll put the tires on hold because I okay. whenever I saw you were we were riding uh, that bike, I had a ton of questions uh, pop mm -hmm. up in my head whenever I ran into you on the course. But um, we'll table that for right now. Let's talk about uh, nutrition going into the race. I use a couple of bottles a day of uh, Spiz. It's S P I Z. I think it's made by a company in California. It's a lot of kind of long distance endurance athletes use it. It's um, unlike a lot of other um, powders that you can mix with water in that it's high protein and it's not sugary. It's not uh, uh, high in uh, glycemic index and um, there's about 500 calories per bottle. So that's okay. a way to take on both hydration and nutrition um, in, in without, you know, jamming a bunch of 
food in, in your face. Um, I also had just uh, Laura bars, um, Cliff bars, and uh, Snickers and stuff like that. And I bought similar things out of convenience stores on, on the way, in addition to barbecue sandwiches and breakfast tacos. And, and um, I hit one. I had Whataburger, the obligatory stop in uh, Palestine, yeah. that's the 24-hour <laughs> Whataburger. I hit them hard uh, uh, the beginning of uh, the second morning to get me through that that long day from Palestine down to uh, Groveton. Yeah, which so for people special. who haven't done it, that's a 100-mile stretch with no resupply. Yeah. Do, have you ever seen um, Ride the Divide? Uh, Yes. Isn't yes. that what that one guy had? Was it, I don't was, remember. It's I think he had like, an all spiz. No, yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah. he did the entire Our, tour divide yeah. with all spiz, and he was getting it mailed to him uh, at different post office boxes. Yeah. Well, I wasn't that committed to it. You know, it was kind of a supplement. Yeah. Uh, I well, like. I also like solid food. Well, oh yeah, for sure. Um, when you found out about the coronavirus, did you? Uh, take on more food on your bike or you I know really didn't. in, in I the thought, case I that there was a stores are going to be open you really I did on those stores to be open and i'm you know i knew i wasn't going to starve to death i mean i might yeah. go a little hungry i might go ketonic but um as long as i had water i knew i was going to be okay if i missed the stop right does your uh military training um and experience as well really um, shed some light and give you some like like that's a that's a very simple thing that most people should understand but you know they could get in that situation and get scared oh no there you know i missed a resupply what am i going to do um anyway yeah ha- has that helped I, you you think i think it helps me i think it helps me for having kind of a systematic approach to planning but that doesn't explain why uh leo wilcox is such a monster <laughs> no you know there's a lot of there's a lot of just studly people out there that were were not Marines that are a lot better at it, more accomplished at that at this than I am. But I think just me, you know, it, it does help me um, probably in ways that I don't even think about, you know, ways that are not even conscious to me. Right. Yeah. It's just part of your life. So what about did, did you do anything when well, you brought up the mental side of it? We talked about the mental side of it earlier. Um did did you do anything differently or do you do anything to train yourself mentally for these types of events? I just try to make sure that I don't uh, fall into despair because I, I have enough experience in these things. I have enough bad experiences of trying to do events or trying to do rides where I made mistakes that um, I felt like going into this event, I was really prepared against making those same mistakes. I Last year, last spring, I was signed up for Arkansas High Country Race, uh-huh. and I was intent on doing it. At that point, I lived in uh, southwest Arkansas, and I was intent on doing it. And I went out and rode parts of the race, uh, parts of the course near Hot Springs. I rode the, that stretch from Poto Mountain over to Mount Magazine. I rode part of the section down in Buffalo River Canyon. I rode some of the toughest sections, and um, I really psyched myself out uh, through the problem of having to hike a bike uh, where the whether the terrain was too bad or is too steep and I had to hike a bike or I was just too wasted or down Buffalo uh, River Canyon it was just too broken up um, you know I couldn't even ride down some of these sections uh-huh. and I really let that mentally demoralize me I remember riding from uh, near Ponca over to Jasper and it taken me you know, what I consider to be an inordinately long time to get that uh, 24, 25 miles and thinking, OK, well, you know, this is this is awful. <laughs> I can't do this. This is this is a failure. And I just I can't do this race. And I remember and I told Chuck Campbell, hey, I'm sorry, this is too hard for me. Um, I give my spot to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to do it this year. And wow. soon after making that decision, I. I of course, I very closely watched the dots during that race, and I saw some people make it and finish, and I, I really thought, you know what? They're a lot tougher than I am. They're a lot mentally stronger than I am. 
And about that same time, I got in the mail, uh, the bikepacking journal. I don't know if you um, mm. subscribe yeah. to that, but it's a I really do. slick, really beautiful magazine. And uh, I read the thing cover to cover. And every <laughs> every story in there made reference to long sections of hike a bike. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, the light went on. Hey, you know, you're not a triathlete who's going mm-hmm. out and trying to average 20 miles an hour on every ride now. Yeah. This is bike packing. This is different. Hike a bike is part of it. If you're going two miles an hour, that's fine. Probably everybody's got to go. Two Everybody. Miles an hour yeah. Mm-hmm. So don't, don't give in to despair. Don't, don't go, you know, have to get off the bike and then say, okay, well I'm failing. Mm-hmm. Just see it for what it is. It's bike packing. It's hard. Don't, um, you know, wallow in negativity. And I think I took those lessons, those hard negative lessons into this race. And I, I never had a moment when it was pouring down rain on me, that really, really bad thunderstorm that hit us right before I was coming into Bryan and College Station. Yeah. The hike a bike where I didn't even expect it. The uh, old Groveton Road, which was horrific. I never had a moment where I thought, okay, you know, screw Billy Rice, screw this course. <laughs> screw East Texas. I, I really, the whole time I felt positive. I felt, Hey, this is it. This is the course. This is the race. This is grand gravel. It's hard. You can do this. You got enough food and water to make it. If you got to walk the 18 miles remaining to on Alaska, then that you're going to walk it. Yeah. And I, I just was determined that, uh, as long as I had, you know, food and water and, or at least water, I was going to be okay. There was, I was not in any kind of life threatening situation. So I was just going to push myself to, um, to the max. And I think one thing that helped me a lot was having a uh, crude for Jose Bermudez on his, um, race across America uh, in uh, 2014. Uh, I, I didn't was, know about uh, that. Um, yeah. Real quick, why don't you tell people who Jose is? I know him. Uh, he's a local guy. Um, but yeah, tell tell us who he is and then uh, about that experience, please. Jose, is a, uh, Jose Bermudez is a philosophy prof um, there at, at Texas A&M. He was um, my dean when I was a grad student there. And um, we, rode the bike, we rode bikes a lot together and made uh, a strong friendship. And in 2014, he asked me to be part of his crew for Race Across America. And um, I was uh, kind of the, the night shift crew guy. I was on a crew with a lady named Janice Tower, who's a really accomplished ultra cyclist and coach up in Anchorage, Alaska. And um, she's his coach. And we um, were kind of the PM crew that supported uh, Jose through race across America. And that's 3,005 3, miles from Oceanside, California to um, Annapolis, Maryland. So a lot of what I learned about uh, ultra cycling um, is attributed to Jose and what I saw him do and what he's uh, taught me. And and I, I really saw him suffer. Uh, I saw a guy in the depths of extreme suffering and he never despaired he never lost his composure. He never lost his dignity. He uh, was continually kind to us and patient with us as we crewed him. And, um, you know, I learned a lot from that. I, I saw yeah. him in, I think, Kansas or Missouri. I saw him so tired coming out of the hotel after sleeping for maybe three hours, getting back on the bike to ride another 20 hours. I saw him so tired and uh stiff it took him three or four tries just to get his leg over the bike oh to mount up and and continue riding so i you know i i've seen suffering yeah i I knew that nothing i did in grand gravel approached that level of of suffering i was uh, at times uncomfortable but i knew that i wasn't suffering jose's a He's he's an inspirational figure. I, I he's someone that I would actually like to get on the show and and chat with. Um, he's done. I mean, for people who don't know him, he's he's got like the bike packing triple crown, which is yeah. uh, I don't know. It was Tour Divide, Trans Am. Do you remember the third one? 
He's done Ram, official finisher, Ram. 2014. The year after that, he did Tour Divide. Um, I think top 10 finisher. The year after that, he did Trans Am. I think he was a top 10 finisher. And then the, a couple of years after that, uh, he, he did um, the Iditarod 1,000-mile race in Alaska. Yeah. And he just got off another crazy uh, adventure up in yeah. Alaska where he's going to ride from one end to the other. Uh, he had to be pulled due to frostbite yeah. concerns. Yeah. Uh, things got really serious. And uh, from my pers- I mean, he just got out of surgery, didn't he, for a hip? Yeah. I mean, the guy's an animal. I mean. <laughs> oh, he, he's, he's just, he's just a, he's Yeah, I well, I mean, I was just thinking, I mean, that that is an incredible mental um, uh, training that you went through to see that and see that firsthand and have that perspective uh, and understanding, like, going into that. That really does help. Um, you were able to see it firsthand. Um, <clears throat> so going into this year's race, what did you have? Well, of course you had goals. W- what were your goals going into the race? I really just wanted to finish. I've never done a race that was 500 miles before. I knew it was going to be very tough. I just wanted to finish. I really didn't have any expectations beyond that. I I thought it'd be nice to finish by um, noon. No, I guess by 6 p.m. I wanted to finish by 6 p.m. on Saturday, and I wound up finishing about 11 p.m. Mm. Which really the main the difference there, the differential between 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. was the hike of bike. Yeah, the rain, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, that yeah that's worth mentioning. I mean, <clears throat> we were actually uh, forecasted to get a week worth of rain before the race actually took off. And then yeah. it was supposed to continue through the whole thing. Um, I know you got hammered a little bit with the rain, but I, I think that it actually was probably a lot better than it could have been. I agree. <laughs> we, Cause we actually like going up to the race, we had very little rain, at least, uh, I mean, you know, it's 500 mile race, so I'm not familiar with the entire route, um, but um, I'm in the general area and we didn't get a ton of rain going into it. Right. Um, yeah. So what what about like uh, daily goals? Uh, you said, you know, first 500 mile race. Did you were you just going to ride till you got tired? Were you going to try to make certain points along the way? Uh, how did how did you break that down? I really, because of the rain, mainly because of the rain, I tied myself to places where I knew I could get lodging. So that meant day one, I was going to make it to Palestine, and I was going to stay in a hotel in Palestine. So that's 250 miles, right? 210. Two, oh, 210? Yeah, 210. Okay. The route's different this year than when yes. I wrote it a little yeah. bit, so um, the mileage is a little bit off. Okay, so 210. Yeah, my initial first... plan was to go to Palest- to, to uh, try to bivy at Elkhart, and that's 197 miles. And then I'm like, well, Palestine's right there. Okay, let, let's think about <laughs> that. And then I looked at Palestine to wherever, and then I knew there was a KOA campground at, on Alaska. And I said, well... I know that's going to be a, a very hard stretch, so let me plan on just staying there at on Alaska. So what that allowed me to do was to, well, I made the decision to ditch the bivy, which is, you know, it's kind of, it now allowed me to go light, but it yeah. is a risky decision because if something goes wrong, you got no, you got no shelter. Right. But uh, that's, that's what I went with. And I said, I'm going to ride to Palestine. I'm going to sleep in a hotel for a couple hours and I'm going to jump out and go down to, um, on Alaska. I'm going to, uh, stay down there in a cabin and then I'm going to make the final, the final push home. So that was my, those were my intermediate points. And I was, wow. my plan was tied to those points because of the rain. Um, I felt like if the weather had been okay, I would have been fine, uh, bivy and wherever just go as far as i can push as far uh-huh. as I can and bivy up somewhere but because Interesting. it was that much rain i said hey look don't be a knucklehead <laughs> um, just stay where you can be out of the rain get your bike in in the light look at it pm it you know maintain it and then push out there the next day because i'd never done 500 miles did you just throw a military term in there? PM it? Uh, yeah, preventive maintenance. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Oh. No, I liked it. I was just curious. 
Uh, all right. So that I actually try not to do a whole lot of research on my uh, guests on the show, just so it can be a more authentic conversation. But I did see that you made a post and I saw that you stayed in hotels. Yeah. Um, and I was really actually kind of jealous or I don't know, because when I did it, I, I never even considered a, a hotel. Um, but yeah. having done it and hearing that you did it, I'm like, man, that uh, that sounds pretty nice. Well, if it's right there, right? Then what? What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. You're just carrying Listen. extra weight, so you can can't like. There's a difference between a bike packing race and going out and bike packing for fun. Right. And you're bike packing for fun. You want to go. You want to camp. You want to have the whole experience. Uh, and this is part of the reason why I don't do a lot of races is because that's mostly what I'm into. But if you're gonna go race, yeah. If you can leave the baby at home, leave all that stuff at home and check into a hotel and uh, have a really good sleep and get on the road. Yeah. You don't have to set anything up. You know, you don't have to, you just, you just go. And it, and like you said, if you need bike maintenance, you're in a good uh, uh, area to be able to just work on your bike if you need to. So right. um, are you, are you pretty happy with that decision that you made? I, I think it was the it made the difference in making it or not making it. I don't know. I and hats off to Haas Kleinschmidt. I think he slept in the rain at first night, and um, I don't know how I would have held up. You know, I mean it's it's hard enough anyway. Um, but um, what? A, oh, sorry. I I just think it was very very helpful into me finishing and 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 feeling as good as I did through it. <clears throat> Having done it now, uh, let's say next year you, you do it again. The weather is it's not going to rain. Do you think that you keep that same approach, or would you would you bring a bivy and 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 try to go all out and see? Um, you know, if, if next year I'm in a position to do it and the route lends itself or the route doesn't lend itself to doing billeting, you know, uh, stay in a hotel and and it's it's not it doesn't look like it's going to be pouring down rain, then yeah, bivy. Yeah. Because it is faster, you know. Well, yeah, it, it's faster if you can go farther. Right. If you can't go farther, you know, I got so I guess that's where the question is. At, at 210 miles, did you feel like I could keep going, or did you feel like okay, I'm I'm really good for a nap right now? Uh, I knew I could keep going, but keep going to do what? To do an additional 20 miles and to then, sleep in the rain. You no, know, lay down and sleep in the rain. Yeah. So uh, yeah, if it's not raining, uh, then you just go. That's and, right. If uh, it's not raining, you push the other 20 miles, 30 miles yeah. and go. But that, that's the first, you, you know, it's, it's more than one day race. Yeah. It's more than well, a that, two day race for me. That, that's what makes it fun. I think right. it's, it's figuring out all those, the pros and cons of should I camp? Should I hotel? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and you're making the decision before. It's not like you had a bivy and you can, just keep going and bivy you're committed to that you know so uh that's part of the fun and the strategy that goes into the race and you get to go and test out your theory and see if it works or not this year it sounds like even without the bivy i wasn't going to freeze to death you know i was going to be uncomfortable yeah if if my bike broke or something like that and i was stuck on old growth and road and the sun had gone you know i just couldn't go any further or whatever you know i was going to get out my my dry uh, polar fleece shirt and put that on and put all my other gear back on. And I was going to be fine. Right. You know, I was going to be a little comfortable. I was going to be okay. I was going to be all right. Yeah. That's worth mentioning. I mean, I was very happy to see it wasn't going to be cold and wet like it was last year. And hypothermia hypothermia was a, uh, a real issue that people were dealing with last year. So, Mm. um, this year it was very mild temperatures. They moved the race back about a month, which helped tremendously, tremendously. So, uh, mm-hmm. which I think was a, a really smart move, uh, for this very reason. Uh, we kind of got into a pickle last year, not me personally, but the, the race did. Oh, I watched that last year. I watched the dots and I watched the weather and man, it was horrendous. And, and part of my thinking this year, which is not, you know, this, I wouldn't recommend this thinking to anybody, but this is the wishful thinking, positive thinking that I think you have to adopt every now and then. I thought uh, it can't be that bad two years in a row. <laughs> no, I mean, I agree with you. Uh, positive mental attitude is really, uh, 
I, I'm not I'm not an expert, but I would say the the mental side, like we said, is probably almost more important than your physical ability to yeah. uh, to do something. So having a good mindset going into it and keeping it throughout the event, I think, is really huge. Yeah. Um, well, let's just break down uh, each day real quick. So day one was Brian to Palestine, which was 210 miles. Right. Walk us through that day. I mean, you started out as a group of three. How did how did that day go down? I immediately started losing, hemorrhaging a bunch of time, fooling around with my spot tracker, trying to get it to be visible to track leaders. Oh, that was uh, right. That's so track frustrating. Leaders didn't know that we were actually running the race. You know, the three of us. So they uh-huh. were didn't pay attention to it, which they didn't. They shouldn't have. And I had to. Um, it took me really all day to sort out my problem which I think was I had entered some some bad info or the wrong site or something that, like that when I registered the uh, the spot uh, the spot tracker with track leaders. They sorted it out that night while I was in Palestine. But that that cost me some time and it cost me contact with Brian Steele and Hoss Kleinsmith. And it was kind of demoralizing. Um, you know, I run into the Walmart in uh, Madisonville where people are buying up the last of the drinking water and you know bought to buy new lithium batteries and put those in it still didn't solve the problem but other than that it was a really nice first day the the thunder showers that were supposed to hammer us on the first day just kind of bumped slightly to the north instead of being right on top of us and it was a fairly dry and uh tailwind driven day it was oh. nice it was really nice going up that's, the top. Yeah, yeah. Especially with the in contrast to what was forecasted. I mean, that's a that's a gift from God right there. <laughs> that, was nice. yeah, that was nice. Got up I'm to curious. Elkhart. I found the the uh, convenience store in Elkhart and bought some food and um, replenished my water up there at Elkhart and then made the last hour, the last push up to um, Palestine. The spot tracker. Were you concerned with that just from being in compliance with a non-official race or did you want your loved ones to be able to track you or what was the motivation there to even be concerned about it? Uh, my loved ones were able to track me on the app, you know, just on the spot tracker app because I had practiced that uh, right. on previous trips. And they were able to see me, but I didn't I wanted my dot to be visible on on track leaders because I knew some people were looking at it. Yeah. You know? And I didn't want it to be like, well, where's this guy? You know, I thought <laughs> three. What's this guy's problem? And I don't know. It just, it was kind you of. You wanted it to count. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you, I mean, you went all the way. You did all the things. You're one of three people and you want it to count. Exactly. Yeah. And plus, I mean, I'm grateful because for people who don't know, I caught up to you, uh, I guess, about 80 miles from the finish uh, just to take some pictures and, and, and say hi briefly. And I wouldn't have been able to find you if you didn't have your track going. So yeah, yeah. that helped me out pretty well. Okay, so you check into the hotel. How how long? You said you slept for like two hours? No, I probably slept uh, three and a half hours there. Okay, still. Okay, okay. So what was your sleep strategy going into this? Um, yeah. Just try to get a one REM cycle of sleep at each place. Just okay. a good solid at least three hours of sleep at each place. So did you do any kind of like studying on yourself to figure out how long it takes to get in a rim to, to get that restorative sleep? No, I, I just know myself well enough that, uh-huh. you know, that feel like I, I reset pretty well with three hours, at least short term. All right. So how did you feel on the morning of day two when that alarm w- went off? I felt fine. Um, I felt uh, not fine when I walked out and saw the rain pouring down. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a great segue. So let's get into day two. And what was that like? Um, pouring rain. I went through the Whataburger drive through and I can tell <laughs> the you that. <laughs> that's right. The Whataburger, well, they were closed, right? And Oh, that's right. All they were doing was drive through. So the little sensor, I couldn't set it off of my bike. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm ready to order now. And, you know, they ignored me so i wound up driving up to the window and ordering and it was all good so <laughs> did they give you some funny looks no they were they're really cool they, they were very apologetic about the fact that they didn't hear me up there at the at the little speaker box 
Uh, good old and, Texas. Uh, yeah, yeah, nice people. And uh, bought a bunch of food there. I ate some of it. I stored the rest of it away and got going in the, in the rain to make the trip down to Groveton and almost immediately got into uh, red sticky mud and hiked a bike. Yeah, so let's describe that section for people um, this day two from Palestine to Groveton. Do you want to take that one? It just goes through really microscopically small towns where there's, you know, eight houses and one church and no convenience stores, no support. The roads are really, really bad. Um, you're right on the east edge of Davy Crockett National Forest. So there's not a lot of traffic through there. And yeah. it's a low lying area and it gets very, very muddy. And it's silty clay mud that um, very tough to to uh, to ride through. Is not and, and parts of it are sticky mud, sticky like the classic um, land run, you know, peanut butter mud stick to your tires and jam up your drivetrain. And um, so you have to work to to clean that stuff off your bike, even to push it, um, even in places where you can't ride it. Man. So I'm actually a little surprised to hear that. I remember when I did that section, um, going into Groveton, it got uh, a little muddy. Mm -hmm. And then after Groveton, when you hit the Groveton Road, which is right. an infamous, what is it, like two or four mile stretch of road? I think it's uh, four miles. Four miles. And I, when I did it, the year I did it, I have a picture on my Instagram where my bike is completely standing up straight yeah suspended by the mud yeah. only. i mean it, it's like a, it, it's insane um yeah. so it, it's that bad but I, I was surprised so what percentage do you say of that you know 100 110 mile stretch was really muddy uh is that it, it truthfully probably 15 percent okay but it was like intermittent throughout the whole thing to where it right. kept hitting you. And, uh, right. interesting. Okay. Uh, Hoss Kleinsmith who did it, who did the race last year, that was also a really, really bad year. Um, you know, who, who was a, a finisher last year told me that it was, you know, in his words, 10 times worse this year in terms of just muddiness and destroying his drive train and wow. it's hard to keep the bike going. Wow. So did you run into any issues with that? How were you keeping going with all the mud? I walked the bike where I needed to. I cleaned it off as best I could. Uh, the thing that I couldn't really help was the fact that the sand in the sandy, silty mud uh, wore away my um, my brake pads. Oh. So by the time I got down to Groveton, my brakes were very, very iffy. They were not functioning well at all. Now I feel even worse whenever you and I ran into each other and <laughs> <laughs> I caught up to you and you're on a downhill and trying to stop and <laughs> yep. you were much faster than I thought you were going to be in my defense. Uh, I was like, I thought I, I literally just like drove up and I was going to sit there for a while and wait for you and you come barreling down the road. Um, <laughs> I was feeling good there. Good. good. Well, so no brake pads going into basically day three. Yeah. All right. So, uh, but before we get into day three, so where is the, is the KOA in Groveton? No, no. It's in, uh, on Alaska. So on Ala that's Groveton. right. I got into Groveton. I got, um, like a burger basket and then a chicken strip sandwich to go and, uh, pushed on out of there as it started to get dark. And I knew having talked to Billy Rice, I knew that old Groveton road was actually called on old on Alaska road as you go from north to south. I knew that was going to be a bear. I knew that I should count on hike a bike. And that's 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 what I got. Yeah. And that was it's only 19 miles down to down to on Alaska. But for me, that was four and a half hours. Whoa. Really? Four and a half hours? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Talk about it. I mean, that's where the mental side and knowing yeah. what you're going up against really comes in when you're like, what, if you had gone into that and said, OK, it's only 19 miles. I'll be there in about an hour and a half. Right. Deal. Maybe two hours if it's bad conditions. Um, 
but you knew it was going to be bad. So four and a half hours, how did, did that have an impact on you or were you just prepared for that? I was prepared for it. Um, I was a little bit anxious when I saw a sign that said road closed. I didn't know when, I don't know what that, you know, closed to who, um, I didn't know really how to interpret that. Mm -hmm. Um, so that caused some anxiety. Once I got up to where the road closure was, I saw that it was a bridge out that I could just hike the bike through. (laughs) I've been in the exact same spot on a, in a trip to West Virginia. Yeah. We had a road, road closed sign. And it was the end of the day and we were tired and it was just like, all right, what do we do? There's a yep. reroute, but it's a very long reroute. Yep. And we went ahead. And it was the same thing. Bridge closed, hike a bike. Get, it's fine. No big yep. deal. But yep. anyway, yeah, th- those are uh, interesting moments when you really have to think about how you want to proceed. <laughs> and, uh, and hope exactly. you choose correctly. <laughs> but the only other option was to go back to Groveton. And that was, you know, through probably three miles of slop hike the bike in the dark. Uh-huh. And I'm like, no, nah, man, Billy <laughs> said he did it. Bill, when he, he said it was four miles when he did it, let's just keep pushing. Let's see what it's like on the other side. And yeah. really vehicle traffic helps you out. If you're in a place where you know, there's no vehicle traffic, you know, you're in trouble because there's nothing to kind of pack the sand down, nothing to kind of make a track. And that's why, you know, this race taught me that, if you've ridden one mile of gravel, you've ridden one mile of gravel. It's all different. You know, my idea of staying out of the, the ruts caused by trucks and vehicles, that changed when in places where it's soggy, in places where the roadbed itself is soft, you want to be in those tire ruts, even though it's bumpy, even though it's muddy and the big wet mud holes are there. That's the place that the truck and vehicle tires have displaced the soft mud. And that's what got me out of there on the other side of where that bridge was out. Right. Even though the road tr- continued to be really, really awful. Uh, I followed the tire tracks out until, you know, about an hour later, it, <laughs> the road just unceremoniously turned into blacktop <laughs> with a, <laughs> with a, a yellow stripe down the middle of it. I thought I was <laughs> seeing some kind of a mirage, you know, um, uh, but I was rewarded for just pushing through, and I wound up getting into um, on Alaska that night. The lady that manages the campground there actually uh, came looking for me about uh, you know deep in the night. I'm driving around, riding around on my bike with no brakes, trying to find the, um, my cabin, and she comes buzzing up on her golf cart to say, "Hey, you know, I want to help you find your, your cabin." Uh-huh. That, was, that was really cool. Texas comes through again. That's Look right. at us. We're doing That's good. Good people. Uh, how, how, so how long did you sleep that night? Yeah, only about two and a half hours because I was really um, anxious. My, my phone wasn't recharging. So my whole, it was, got down to about 14% battery. So I just decided just to turn it. I, last thing I did was I texted my wife, hey, my phone's not recharging. I'll talk to you when I talk to you. Just follow my dot. And mm-hmm. then. I turned it off to try to maintain, just preserve what I had, not knowing if I'd ever be able to turn it back on. That was a little bit nerve wracking. And I put uh, replacement brake pads in my front brakes, hoping that that would fix me, hoping that that would make my brakes okay. And um, so I was really kind of anxious about those factors and I didn't sleep very long there. And I knew the next day was my last day and I wanted to get up and get going. So I slept about two and a half hours there. Stuff. Real quick on your uh, on your re- on your charging system and and your phone was that just like your phone wasn't charging or or what was causing my that? My phone's at the end of its lifespan, and I have I actually foolishly mounted my phone on my um, handlebar stem last year for a while when I was training for uh, thinking about Arkansas High Country route, and I think I actually sweated enough on the screen of that thing that some of it got down into that little recharging port. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, I think it's that's operator error. I don't want to, you know, trash iPhone here on your on your podcast. I think that's <laughs> it's just a factor of having a phone. It's a little bit old, and it's had a lot of sweat okay. put on it. 
I was brand new to a dynamo whenever I did the Grand Gravel 500. And yeah. uh, I had some issues with mine going into it and got a new one at the very last minute. And long story short, I had I, I was having some trouble recharging as I went. So uh, I, actually, while we're on the topic, what did you use to recharge? Were you on a I dynamo? I did a dynamo and my dynamo worked great. I uh, have an SP dynamo hub and a sine wave light. And it worked great. Uh, the, the, the shortfall in charge of my phone was my phone. Okay. And everything else that I needed to recharge, I was able to recharge fine. I have yeah. little pinkies that have USB uh, recharging, and I run two of them. So when one of them went out, I'd charge the other one. All right, I'd charge the one that went out. Uh, I'd recharged my Wahoo element. And um, all of that worked great and really kept me um worry free on that front and you were charging everything off your dynamo yeah i love that how um, cool is that you know <laughs> I, love it. I love it creating energy as you go i mean self i mean talking about self-supported you know yeah. i just I, I love all of that all right so you wake up at what time on the morning of day three and head out and what was that like uh 3 a.m i guess 3 4 a.m okay. And uh, pushed out. It was cool. It wasn't raining, but it was cool. I knew the temperature was going to drop, so it was low, mid 40s. Uh, heading down to Point uh, Point Blank. Point Blank. And, yep, Point Blank. And I, some a little voice told me, "Get ready for more hiker bike." And it it turned out to be true. The the road. As soon as I got off of the hard surface road near Point Blank, it was more hiker bike for hours. Previous to what, it, it, very similar to what I had experienced previously on Old Groveton Road. You say very similar? Yeah. Really? Yeah. What section? Um, between um, Point Blank and New Waverly. Whoa. Okay. Yes. yes. I'm actually pretty familiar with that section. I'm I'm surprised, but uh, mud, I, bad mud, and I was I, in I was in the dark. Oh, even better. <laughs> yeah. And I, would, I uh, got the bike off of the road. I couldn't I couldn't even push the bike on the road because the, the mud accumulated on my wheels and drivetrain so fast. So I walked over on the like the shoulder where it was grassy just so I wouldn't have mud building up on my on my wheels. Right. And that was I want to say that was uh, a couple, three hours I was doing that. I was much later getting into New Waverly than I planned. Wow. Let's actually take a moment to talk about your tire choice because <clears throat> right uh, right around the same time, the, oh shit, uh, Mid-South race, I was about to call it Land Run, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Mid-South race uh, took place and Payson McClellan or McClellan, however you say his name, uh -huh. won. And I was reading some of his stuff and talking about his tire choice. And he went with a really narrow tire and talked about how you want to go narrow so you sink down mm -hmm. and then get traction and be able to keep going. Yeah. And as a Texan, I'm very familiar with mudding. And if you look at military Jeeps, as I'm sure you're familiar with, they have the, the tall, skinny tires on them. Yeah. Uh, you know, you see these big trucks driving around with big old tires. That's actually not what you need whenever you go out uh, and you're trying to, you know, go mudding or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny. But um, I, so I was curious about your tire choice earlier, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about it. Uh, you said that you just maxed out your Warbird. Was that the only factor? Or were you thinking about your tire choice in terms of, sinking down in the mud and getting traction and not carrying as much weight on your tires and accumulating so much mud. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just kind of curious about if that factored in and then how did, did you I did want to go those? with a skinnier tire. I had 38, um, 38 Pan Eraser Gravel King SKs on before that. But then when I rode from, you know, up around Groveton in very muddy conditions, I was very unstable. I was very prone to slip out because there was no there are no little side knobs there's no side tread on the shoulders of that tire you know it's just rounded and slick you know what i'm saying 
Yeah. So that's why I went with the the other tires that I had, the Maxxis Ramblers, because they had some track, some some tread right there on the little edges. Um, the the downside of that was it was a bigger tire that fit bigger into my frame. So. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I was gonna run like a. Originally, I was thinking about running a two point one. Mm-hmm. And then if it was muddy, I might have gone to like a 2.6. But yeah. now I'm thinking it makes more sense. I, I'm understanding the logic behind a narrower tire mm-hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons. It, it's going to sink down and get traction. And then it also it's not going to build up all the mud on the tire. You got a big knobby tire. All it's yeah. going to do is collect that mud. Well, that uh, Max's tire was good at shedding mud. It was pretty good at shedding mud. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I was interested to talk to you about that, but, uh, so where were we on day three? We got through coming out of on Alaska heading yeah. toward new Waverly, new Waverly. Yeah. Yeah. So day three, uh, how were you feeling overall? I mean, mentally, physically, was anything hurting? How were you feeling? Nothing was hurting, but I was, I was feeling the tired, the tiredness and the sleepiness from, the accumulation of three nights of kind of short sleep and the, just the effort of putting in, you know, over, over 300 miles at that point, you know, tired, but not, uh, not devastated. Yeah. Uh, I felt a little sleepy on the morning of day three, but I, I was, I felt like I would come out of it. Um, I felt like I would, you know, you go through peaks and valleys on this sleepiness issue um, your body goes through cycles and you just trust that you're going to come out on a little bit higher cycle within a few hours. And I, and I did, by the time you, you ran into me, I wasn't sleeping any, I wasn't sleepy anymore. I had caught up on calories. I felt good. I was trying to really push, um, make the best use of my time, the daylight that I had left. Yeah. What, what is your personal motivation for pushing yourself? There's nobody else in the race. It's not even a race anymore. It's just a grassroots, unsanctioned ride that you're doing. Um, the mud, the rain, the sleep. What What is the thing that like keeps propelling you forward and pushing you to make good use of your time, as you say? Well, two things. One, uh, I find that I'm less comfortable on the bike if I'm soft pedaling. Mm. Um, when you're just sitting there on the bike, moving your legs... To me, it's it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable in your saddle. It's uncomfortable in your upper body. It's more uh, comfortable if you're actually applying just a little bit of power to the pedals. You don't have to be, you know, like going full gas or, you know, really laying down the watts or anything. But just just applying some power right. makes you actually more comfortable on the bike. And yeah. The second well, time, it, it, I, I, I agree. I, I've noticed that as well. It, mm-hmm. you're, you're pushing down more pressure. So it's relieving pressure on your sit bones. And exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And the other factor was, um, I was pretty sure my wife was somewhere waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> did, did she, uh, she stayed in Hewitt and then just came in around the time when yes. she thought, Okay. She and my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law uh, and my sister-in-law also live in Hewitt about uh, five minutes from us. My sister-in-law teaches at Baylor too. And um, they came over, they just watched my dot and came over to meet me at the Stella Hotel at the finish line to bring me home. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, they, they drove over in my wife's car and my brother-in-law Lloyd uh, drove my truck back over so I could just turn into a zombie on the way home. Much needed and much oh, deserved, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. We had the opportunity to run into each other. Well, I guess I made the opportunity, but um, I was sitting at home, social isolating, and uh, some people on the Facebook uh, chat room or whatever, the Facebook group, mm-hmm. um, were, were curious about the conditions and, and whatnot. And so I had already thought about really what I wanted. When I thought it was going to be a race, um or when I thought more people were going to show up, I was going to like drive the route in reverse uh-huh. and just take pictures. I, I, I uh, made the decision personally to stay home with my girls. I felt like I needed to be home uh, and, and make sure that they were 
well cared for in this kind of weird thing. I, I needed to be available for my family, basically. But um, I was like, heck, I'll take the girls on a little adventure and uh, load them up in the car and go, you know, take some pictures and maybe get to chat with some people, um, you know, a little bit as, as they go on their journey. Um, but it turns out you happen to be the last man standing and you're the only one. So uh, I was sitting at home with Sloan and started, I, I, was, I had been watching the dots the whole time and uh-huh. uh, saw where you were and I was in a good spot to be able to go and drive out and take some pictures uh, and, and, and say hi. So uh, I already said that, you know, you were moving pretty fast and you came up on me a lot faster than I was expecting. Honestly, when I saw you, you looked totally fine. Yeah. Like you, yeah. you, uh, you were moving, uh, you seem very lucid yeah. and, uh, you seemed happy. You seem yeah. very, very content, very happy. So I, I, I just wanted to kind of get your flip on that situation. Uh, where were you at whenever we uh, met up on the course? Uh, I was feeling strong. I'd just eaten half a pizza in, uh, Richard's <laughs> mm-hmm. and, uh, tried to, tried in vain to to tighten up my brakes a little bit adjust my brakes but um at that point you know i felt good i knew i was well under 100 miles to go and um it was raining on me but not hard uh, i felt good i didn't i didn't have i didn't have my phone turned on so i didn't know if hoss was still in it or not and um i just felt uh felt great and was on top of the world yeah, well, I loved I loved your attitude. I was expecting to find you a little more worn down than you actually were. No offense, I don't I don't know you <laughs> until I I met you at that moment and uh, talking to you now. But uh, just thinking about my own personal experience, I was expecting you to be a little bit more worn down uh, and and looking a little more ragged. But you you looked uh, very motivated. I think is a good word. I I just felt like you were really in the moment and 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 taking it as it as it came and and riding your bike and uh going towards the finish yeah that's how i felt that's awesome i actually feel a little bad i i inserted a little bit of negativity into uh your world because i remember i have to say i mean you you experienced the race much better than i did and maybe that goes back to the mental side you know being my first time um but I slept about almost where I caught up to you. I was 80 miles from the finish uh-huh. and completely spent. And I still regret it to this day. It still is a thorn in my side. But I made the decision to sleep on that same road where you were. Okay. Um, you know, uh, so that was my perspective whenever I was catching up to you. Is like I'm thinking about myself at that time. Mm-hmm. And I was really rocked. And you looked great. So I just I just wanted to say that I was really happy for you and excited to see that you were doing so well. Yeah, I appreciate that. It, it, we all go through peaks and valleys on these things. And I think, you know, I could have been sleepy and wrecked and needing to take a nap at a, a place where you would have been feeling good. It's, it's different for everybody when you, you know, feel like you need to, to sleep. You jump off and sleep. You try not to waste any time un- unnecessarily. And when you're feeling good, lay it down. When you need to take a nap, take a nap. Yeah. Well, kudos to you, man. Uh, one thing that, um, like, the 24-hour time trials and other events I've done have, have taught me is to not you know, to really be disciplined about not thinking ahead and just really relentlessly focusing on the mile you're riding right now. Uh, several times I would catch myself fantasizing about finishing what I was going to tell people about what it was like to run. And then I would come back to reality and say, no, shut up. You are just north of Navasota right now. You know, we're near done. You focus on what you got to do right now. And and don't, you know, don't start fantasizing about what you're going to eat or how great it's going to be to finish. You must focus on right now, you yeah. know, or the next next three or four miles, whether or not you're going to stop at Gibbons Creek and, you know, analyzing what your situation is right in that moment. Because if you start fantasizing about finishing or being done, then when you inevitably have to come back to reality, 
it's a real, real downer, and you don't need that kind of um, drag. You don't yeah. need that kind of negativity. Man, those are very wise words. I appreciate that. Um, Billy Rice, I remember, said whenever we went to a race prep for the Grand Gravel, whenever I did it, um, just focus in, like, the, the one key takeaway that he had was be in this moment right yes. now. Yes. Look at the rock right in front of your tire. Yes. Don't worry about, you know, and I tried very hard to adhere to that. But uh, again, you know, uh, at the end of the race, 80 miles from home, um, I struggled. So I'm looking forward to going back and, and, and working on that, that aspect. But I think that's very wise words that, that people need to understand is, is just really focus on being on the moment. And, and I like the way you, you said that tra- that mental transition from thinking about the finish to being back in what is actually reality. Yeah. If you can just be in that reality all the time and, and live in it and be okay with it and not worry about the finish, the finish is going to come, but yeah. just, just focus on the task at hand, worry about that, do the best you can in that moment and and that's all you can do right so it, it makes a lot of sense logically sitting here talking about it, it's very easy to do uh but to actually be there to be at the end of your race and be so close and to still stay mentally present i think and 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 on very little sleep too there's a lot of wisdom there and 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 it's, it's something that uh you should strive for probably but um it's not easy to do so again well done sir yeah, thank you. Okay, so the end of the race, what was it like coming in? Uh, how, how were you feeling? What were you I thinking? Felt pretty good. Your... Uh, we yeah. got hammered by thunderstorms right outside of College Station, um, but and my brakes. By the time I got into College Station, my brakes were gone, which made it kind of sad. You know what? When I should have been soft pedaling through the streets of Bryan and College Station, you know University Drive and. April Bloom, near where I lived as a last semester college student, uh, over crossing over Taro and uh, Old College. I was actually walking the bike because I didn't have any confidence in my ability to stop at these intersections. And I could just uh, see myself getting plowed over by a, a truck, you know, um, two miles from the finish. So I actually did a lot of hike a bike in Bryan and College Station just because my brakes had been worn away uh, by the sand of the previous few hundred so- miles. When you say no brakes, I mean obviously you mean no brakes, but like you're you're on a loaded bike. Let's say you're going 10, 12 miles an hour. How long would it take you to stop? Well, it depends on if it's downhill and how fast oh, yeah. I'm going. I, yeah. I mean, if it's downhill, then I'm in I'm in trouble. On University Drive, I was running the bike off into the I was riding on the sidewalk and running off into the grass. Mm. The grass was slowing me down, but. For example, the bridge, the little overpass that goes over uh, Rudder Freeway, you know, I rode up to the top of that at, at University Drive. I rode over the top of that. I dismounted. I walked the bike back down to continue on University Drive over to um, uh, Tarot. Oh, yeah. Tarot? Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of sad, you know. Who's he? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> with his hood over his bike helmet, shuffling along with his bike. Yeah, <laughs> and I felt bad for my my family waiting for me, probably looking at my tracker, going, "What what the heck's he doing?" <laughs> but, you know, I'm so, trying not to get hit by a car because right. I careen into a four way intersection with no brakes. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I got it done. Uh, when I crossed 2818, I knew I just had about a half mile to go with no intersections or anything, and I just kind of soft pedaled into Stella Hotel and. Uh, my wife and brother-in-law were there in the lights of the parking lot, and uh, that was that was huge. That was really huge. Was anyone else there besides your uh, family no. member? No, wow. but that you know, I was thrilled that they were there. When I yeah. finished the um, the Delta Epic in Mississippi, I rolled into Bentonia, Mississippi, at 3:30 in the morning, and uh, the finish line was in front of the Blue Springs Cafe, which is kind of I think it's a historic blues. Uh, kind of a juke joint in rural Mississippi, and that was the finish line. And the only being there was a black dog laying in the middle of the road, slapping his tail on the ground. <laughs> and I thought to myself, "This is it. This is this is bike packing. This is adventure racing. 
Yeah. This is the finish line. And if you need more than this to do this sport, you're in the wrong sport. Mm. And uh, so for, for me to have my wife and my brother-in-law there to, at that finish line, that was huge. That was, that was really gravy. That was icing on the cake that I didn't totally expect because, you know, they got, they were coming over from, from Waco. You know, it's interesting to think about. I'm remembering to my own finish of the Grand Gravel 500 and my family was there and my girls were there and that was a very nice thing. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, friends that had showed up, um, you know, a decent little group of people. You know, you're so deprived at that point. You're not really socially Mm -hmm. aware and really you just want food and sleep and a shower. And so like, how much fanfare do you really want in that moment? Uh, As you're describing it, it sounds, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah, just your family uh, there, your loved ones to take care of you, uh, welcome you in. And um, yeah, it's kind of a, it's a romantic uh, and a beautiful thing that you just described. Yeah. You, you gotta be in this for the experience itself not for a big, huge finishing medal or a T-shirt you can show around, but for the um, the intrinsic value of the experience itself. Yeah. It's interesting as this sport continues to grow and progress, I'm hoping we can retain that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, doing it for you, doing it because you want to, you know, growing finding out what your limits are and pushing yeah. past them. Those are the things that really stand out to me. It's it's not that you're going to finish and there's going to be a big check there or a girl in booty shorts yeah. uh, <laughs> get, that's yeah. going to hand you a thing, a bouquet of roses and right. give you a kiss on the cheek and you're going to get notoriety and fame. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid that maybe at one point this sport will go that way. But uh, if I can have any say in it, I, I hope to retain some of what you're talking about, which is just doing it for you. Because, yeah. well, actually, what was your personal motivation to do this kind of stuff? I think it's just to uh, explore your own strengths and weaknesses. You know, it's a it's a, a process of self-discovery of... Um, learning how to keep despair at bay, learning how to be appreciative of, you know, little things that you um, experience. To me, uh, bikepacking is kind of a return to the hunter-gatherers that we were 12,000 years ago uh, when we were a much more um, adaptable, much healthier, much more capable human being. Uh, bikepacking is kind of a return to that uh, existence. Yeah. And it's a process of self-exploration. Um, my favorite book of all time is uh, Don Quixote, and uh, kind of mandatory reading for people who are you know, going to get a, a PhD in Spanish. But um, the greatest part of that, and, and Cervantes, the writer of it, was a military guy, and it had traveled widely and had been a uh, prisoner of war for five years in Algeria. Um He's the writer of it, and you can kind of see his own experience come out when, uh, in, in the book, at the end of this thousand-page book, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza return back to their village, uh, which is called La Mancha, in this dusty, forgotten part of central Spain. And uh, it's actually Sancho that speaks and says, you know, to the, to the town, you know, kind of metaphorically, you know, um, open your arms and welcome your son, Don Quixote, who returns uh, vencedor de sí mismo, the conqueror of himself. And every time we do one of these things, you know, to some degree, we've conquered ourselves mm. more than a course, more than uh, mud, more than 500 miles. We, um, in some ways, conquer ourselves. Beautiful. I haven't read that book, um, but now I'm going to put it on the <laughs> reading list. I, 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 I really, that resonates with me. Um, I, when I race, which is limited, I'm only racing against myself. I, I'm looking for an opportunity to find out how far I'm capable of going. 
And I'm interested to make that connection to the 12,000 year ago human yeah. and what they went through. We have it so easy right now. Yeah. You know? I mean, everything is climate controlled and fast food and, you know, every, everything is so easy. And, and, and now with the virus, we're actually getting uh, a little bit of a, a peek into what life would maybe be like without all these luxuries that right. we're, we're so accustomed to. Right. Um, but I, I, I look for that opportunity to find out what I am capable of. I understand that humans as a species are extremely capable, but we've kind of dumbed it down as a society and we're not right. asking ourselves to do very much. Right. And so it's good to put yourself in those, at least for me, I, I, I mean, I get so much satisfaction out of self-improvement, growing, finding out what my strengths are, finding out what my weaknesses are, trying to turn my weaknesses into strengths. Right. Um, and, and you can do all of that in bikepacking. And again, no one's talking about a paycheck here. We're talking about you becoming a better person. Yeah. Period. That nope. that's the part about it that I really I, I love. So I, I appreciate your uh yeah. I, I'm definitely gonna put Don Quixote on the reading list. He was a bike packer, he was just on his horse. <laughs> Is that a book I could audio book or do I it's, need to read it? It's the most translated book in the world after the Bible. But in terms of some books I feel like you need to read, right? Like there's some yeah. books um, like the Sand County Al Almanac by Aldo Le Leopold. Uh, I tried that on audiobook and it didn't work for me. That's a book I feel like you need to read. You can make notes, you can underline things. Uh, so some books you can listen to, some books you can read. What category do you feel like this one falls into? Oh, it's very much listening you know, it was written at a time where most people couldn't read and mm. most people digested narrative by sitting around the dinner table and having someone read a couple of chapters out of a book to them. And this book was very episodic like that. And it's written for the ear and it's written by a guy who was a great uh, storyteller and, and, and consumer of stories. Uh, I love that. Yeah. I mean, I'm always, <clears throat> you know, we talked about time and Time is our most valuable asset, in my opinion. Uh, it's the most scarce commodity that we have. So I try to, uh, if I'm doing, you know, yard work or clean, cleaning the house or riding my bike, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, audiobooks, um, always trying to learn, trying to, you know, I mean, yeah, learn, uh, find out. We live in an amazing world, and yeah. there's a lot of great perspectives and stories, and uh, it, there's a lot of value in that. So I, I love audiobooks. Um, this goes back to like us as Americans and humans. is like we're so busy now that yeah. I, I don't feel like I have the time to sit down and read as much as I would like to. And that's changing um, this couple of weeks, right? People are having uh, to engage with their families. People are having to you know, binge things on Netflix. And that's, that's how we uh, take on a lot of narrative nowadays. So, yeah. you know, that we're, we may be rediscovering that. Well, let's actually, I'd love to talk to you about this real quick. Have you, um, having come off of the Grand Gravel 500, just how many days ago? Four or five? Yeah, that was Saturday night. Yeah. Saturday night. Today is Wednesday. Yeah. yeah okay. Saturday. So, have, have you uh, gone on any walks in your neighborhood or bike rides or anything oh, yeah. since then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been have, walking and doing recovery rides, easy rides. Have Have you noticed, uh, I'll just say in my neighborhood, I've lived in this, I've lived in College Station Bryan for 40 years. Yeah. So I'm very familiar with how people recreate outdoors. Yeah. Um, but I've lived in this neighborhood I'm in now for five years. I have never seeing so many people out walking, yep. riding their bikes, yep. um, kids. I went on a bike ride yesterday with my daughter, uh, and there was 14, I don't know, I, yep. I, I approximated 10 to 14 
uh, kids from eight years old to 16 years old riding their bikes in a group. I saw a unicyclist. There was actually a traffic jam on the sidewalk. Yeah. You know, there were so many people. I'm seeing the same thing here. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm just going to spitball here, but this is this is interesting. And I, it got me to thinking about the long-term net impact of this virus. How many people have realized that binge watching Netflix or sitting on their cell phone, not engaging with their children is not bringing value to their lives. You know, how many people are going to go and go on a bike ride or go off for a walk or run or whatever it is, just get outside and realize the value there. You know, I hope hope it, it, it changes. I hope a lot. It's, it's, Crazy. I don't, yeah. I don't have a uh, fully formed opinion on this. I actually just went out for a, a bike ride last night and uh, noticed it and uh, went out today and noticed it as well. And so I think my idea on that will continue to progress. But like I'm I'm interested in how because now you have people that are going out and they're going to have some physical benefit. They're going to have some endorphins, some, mm-hmm. some mental uh, stimulation and, and mental health that will come as a result. And I, I, I don't know how it's going to have a long term impact, but I could foresee. Let's say you take a let's say this thing lasts for a couple of months, which is very plausible and it could go yeah. longer. Yeah. Um, and we're all stuck indoors and we actually find out that. We think we have endless programming on Netflix and Hulu and whatever, and we can just binge watch for days. But we're actually getting to the point where, oh shit, I'm bored of all this. What we'll else am I gonna do? What else am I gonna do? All yeah. right, let's go on a bike ride. Okay, yeah. so I go on a bike ride. Now I'm getting endorphins. I'm feeling good. I'm doing something productive. I'm losing weight. I'm feeling good every morning when I wake up. Uh, and you keep doing it. Then you go okay. back to work. Yeah. All right. Let's say you go back to work in two months from now and you're sitting at your desk and you start gaining weight and your mental health starts getting bad. You start getting anxiety. Maybe you're depressed. And then something clicks. Like when I was active, this all went away. Yeah. And I don't know, man. I've been I've been thinking about this a lot and it's gonna be possible. Huh? It's going to be fascinating. Have Have you thought about this much, or? Yeah. Well, I, I I guess I'm a little cynical. I think once it goes back to normal, you know, post virus, people will go back to the normal routines. But you know, hopefully, some people will choose not to. I think I I agree with you. I mean, I think the realist. I am an optimist, uh, but the realist in me would say most people are just going to not register any of that that I just said, but Uh I think a certain percentage, you know, I mean, people want to, I think, be healthy. People want to live. People don't want diseases, excuse me, um, heart attacks, cancer, whatever it is. For some people, this is going to click. I don't know what that percentage is, but I'm interested uh, to, to follow that. And I hope, I guess, my optimist brain is thinking that we can, as a society, turn this uh, this negative into a positive, and that it will, uh, the long term result will be that people uh, establish better connection with their children, their spouses, their friends. They, you know, this social distancing. We start to value those relationships more, and we treat yeah. people better. Yeah. The other thing that I've been thinking is like how connected we all are. We I don't think we really appreciate how important every single action that we make, everything that we do on a day-to-day basis. You've heard of the butterfly effect we all have, you know, how all of our actions sends ripples through time. Right. But now we are really feeling and seeing and experiencing how a person in Wuhan, China can bring 
down an entire economy, can impact uh, the health and safety of the entire world. The entire planet is now experiencing this on some level. And so I, my thought is, is like, we should just be more mindful of our actions and realize that the things that we do, the things that we say, how we interact with people, they really do matter. They yeah. do really create ripples in time. We're enormously connected. Yeah. Very, no, very I, cool. Yeah. I think it's one of those things that we like kind of knew inherently, but now we have a thing that is making it very real and transparent to us how interconnected we all are. Yeah, yeah. Food for thought, I guess, right? I mean, we'll see how this all carries out, but I, I'm an optimist, so that's where I went with it. <laughs> yeah, well, I I hope so. All right, let it, let's go back and uh, make sure we answer all of David Kelly's questions. Okay. <laughs> He actually had some good ones. So we actually talked about many of them. But what was your best piece of gear? It was probably um, my Outdoor Research Helium 2 uh, rain jacket. And it was something I bought specifically for this event. Um, the other rain jacket I have is kind of a, a straight up bike racing rain jacket. It's one of those clear plastic ones that doesn't have a hood. This one, the Outdoor Research uh, rain jacket, has a hood, and it's very packable. Uh, it, it feels like a windbreaker, but it's totally waterproof. And what what was important to me was that it be um, thin enough to be able to take off and easily pack into a bike jersey or stick it down into my um, camelback um, sleeve, one of those two. And um, it, it did a good job of that. That was very very good piece of gear i think with um a less capable rain jacket i would have been really miserable because that w i was in some situations where it was just pouring down rain on me for hours and then when it got cold on saturday morning um the rain jacket you know the fact that it just kind of kept all of the heat in and all that heat kind of went up into the hood. The heat that escaped out of it up top went up in that hood and kept my head warmer. Uh, was a real, real boost. A good piece of gear. Hmm. How much does that cost? How much did you pay for oh, it? Oh, I want to say it was right around $100. How, uh, how breathable was it? Um, fairly breathable. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a that's a very of, tough question to answer, I know, but I like have the sensation of being in a hefty bag, you know? Yeah. OK, but I, I would ventilate it. I would I would open up. It doesn't have pit zips, but I would when I felt like I was heating up, I would just open up the zipper or unzip it completely. Or, you know, if I started to warm up, it wasn't raining on me. I would just take it off and I didn't have to go through a big gyration of folding it up and putting it in my seat bag because it was so big and stiff. Right. I right. could just roll it up and stick it right in my jersey pocket, which is, that's a pretty pretty good indication of packability. Yeah, no, I mean, when I saw you, uh, I actually was very curious about the rain gear you had. Um, actually, I, um, uh, while we're talking about rain gear, I know that you were wearing shower pass uh, socks and gloves, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I haven't tried those yet, and I'm super curious. How did those work out? Very, very well. You know, you because you have them on for a long time, you do get a little bit of a sensation of, you know, dampness, moisture on the inside. But I tell you, when you're wading through stuff, when water's splashing up on you, when rain is just pouring down on your feet, you, you have that protective barrier in those socks that made them very, very good. Wow. And I'm really glad I had them. The uh, Showers Pass gloves, they're not, you know, great in, in weather sub 30 degrees. But for what I was using them for, you know, rain in 40 degree plus, they were outstanding. Uh, my rain jacket came just right down to cover just the cuffs of them. And I never felt like, you know, ever had that, 
had that sensation of my hands being soaking wet. Mm. Very good. Can you use uh, your iPhone with them? No, you got to take your. I mean, the last, <laughs> the last day I didn't have battery, so I had to ask. <laughs> you got to take those was, off. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your worst piece of gear? Your brakes? <laughs> my brakes, yeah. I mean, well, and that, but that's my fault. Uh, I should have brought at least two more pairs of brand new brake pads with the little frames, with the little frames that go around them to to jam up into your your brake uh, system. Um, that was my my planning failure. I only had one extra set, and they weren't brand brand new, and um, it was nearly my undoing. So that's, I'd say that's my, was, that was my worst piece of gear. But, you know, they were eaten away by the sand. Um, I did have the foresight to bring stuff to keep my drivetrain clean. And that, I think that helped me a lot. All right. Something that you carried that you never used. Uh, all on flat fixing gear. I had stuff to fix probably 10 flats, you know, between <laughs> uh, spare tubes and, um, you know, plugs of different types and sizes and um, CO2 cartridges and spare little inflator heads and a spare uh, pump, a spare actual pump that didn't, you know, if I, for some reason I ran out of CO2s. And, of course, I had all that stuff. And, of course, I didn't have a flat. Yeah, honestly, besides the brakes, it sounds like you got – away pretty scot-free on the yeah. mechanicals yeah which is good i mean if you had had the rain and the mud and you know nobody else there and coronavirus and you had a bunch of mechanicals that would yeah. have been yeah. the icing on the cake maybe uh okay so we all carry or we should all carry you know repair kits and stuff on our bikes when they're doing these events that we hope we don't use. So let's take that off the table. Was there anything else, like what was your least useful or worst piece of gear that you had aside from that? Um, probably my iPhone because I couldn't recharge it. <laughs> Once it got a little bit wet, you know, a little bit damp, a little finicky, then it wouldn't recharge even with my you know, Apple quality recharging cable that I bought open to, to circumvent this problem. But that, you know, it was a good lesson to remind me that you don't need your phone. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, you get, if your, if your bike computer's working, well, you don't need your phone. Just, just push on. Yeah. So you are a few days off the Grand Gravel 500 doing well. What is your next event? Have you already, what do you got percolating? Um, I'm signed up for Arkansas High Country Race. And that was actually my next question. <laughs> and um, if for some reason, and I don't know if I have to teach summer school or I get to teach summer school, I'll have to do it as an ITT in May. Um, but I really want to do it. I'm signed up for it. I'm prepped for it. And that's what I'm pointing for. Nice. Uh, I'm that that make that makes me really happy. Um, I'm going to be there, as most people know, covering the event from a podcasting perspective. Uh, Jared Foster's coming with Bikes or Death to capture the race uh, from a photojournalistic standpoint. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, being there and uh, and getting to experience it at least from the sidelines. Um, have you put it? Have you put in to be a uh, potential guest for that? I haven't. I have not. You should. Well, I haven't done it yet. You know, I I don't feel like I have anything to talk about if I haven't done it yet. Oh, I that's where you and I disagree. <laughs> I mean, you and I we've been talking for almost two hours now. You have plenty to share and uh, lots of experience. That comes just from living, whether it's from, you know, your military background or other cycling experiences that inform how you are going to personally, uh, um, personally, um, you know, tackle the Arkansas high country race. So, 
Yeah, I don't. I, I disagree. I I I, I want to get away from this idea that people's experiences don't matter. That you need to do something amazing or epic to have a worthwhile story or per, perspective to share. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but if it's Arkansas High Country Race experiences, I don't have any yet. So. Well, so the format for that podcast is going to be, I'm going to interview two people, one male, one female. Uh, I'm going to interview them before and then after the race. And so the idea being, you know, what are your training? What is your mental outlook? You uh-huh. know, how are you tackling it? What are your goals? And then follow up, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, however many days it is later. Right, right, right. And, and, and do a, uh, how did your expectations met, meet, meet up with reality kind of deal? Yeah. Well, I think, like I, I said, I'm going to have to do it as an ITT before, beforehand. I don't know if I'm going to be teaching summer school. We don't know if anybody's going to be teaching summer school, but if I'm not teaching summer school, I plan to, to do it with the grand depart on June 6th. I hope you're there, man. It'd be nice yeah, to me, uh, me too, really. Me too. It, it'd be nice to catch up with you, other than uh, just on the side of the road while you're in the middle of a race. Yeah, yeah. So I actually met up with you at almost the exact same spot that Luke Conlon met up with me when I was on my own uh, race, and he ro- he actually lives in Navasota and rode out and. I had no idea. You had no idea that I was going to show up. Right. Uh, um, but he showed up at, I feel like, just a very good time to mentally boost me uh, to the finish. So I was curious, how, how did that impact your experience? Oh, seeing you on the course? Yeah. Oh, man, it was fantastic. No, it was, it was a huge boost. Um, you know, I, we don't know each other. We didn't know each other before the before you came out there, but, uh, I've, I have followed the, the podcast since the beginning and I've loved the podcast. And when I realized it was you, I was like, you know, I felt like a big deal and it was a <laughs> huge, uh, shot in the arm, you know, um, a huge, uh, boost to see somebody out there friendly face, even though we, uh, I only knew you through the podcast. That was, that was an enormous, shot in the arm good good i'm I'm happy to hear that you oh, caught me off guard honestly when you knew who i was I'm, I'm still getting used to the whole idea of you know people knowing me and i'll and and i try to represent my i don't try i do i represent myself this is who i am i'm you know just a guy sitting in my kitchen right now talking to you right. um no big deal like so and that's part of the charm of the podcast too I made a deal with myself when I started it. This is fun and I'm not going to pretend to be anybody else because I don't want to try that hard to pretend to be somebody else for however long this goes on. Right. It's like, why would I do that to myself? So I'm going to be myself. I'm going to, you know, and so when, when you meet me, you have a general sense of who I am just because you've listened to me and all that stuff. But yeah, it still catches me off guard. So <laughs> I was a little, a little cut off guard whenever you uh, said that you uh, knew who I was and all that. And I was like wrapping my head around that. I was going on my own little personal journey there. Well, the first thing I thought when I saw this flannel arm stick out of an open truck window and kind of do this close fist hold up the very first thing i thought was oh no this 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 could be bad and then I, you said you told me your name oh okay <laughs> which i didn't expect to have any problems you know i was born in um fort worth i grew up in college station um went to school in in louisiana yeah i mean i, I feel as comfortable in east texas as anybody but you know, the times we live in, it, yeah, it, take, it only takes one old dude, one old boy in a truck or car or whatever to ruin your day. And um, so that was the very first thing I thought. 
But then when you, uh, you know, said your name, oh, this is great. <laughs> well, like I said, when I saw you, uh, you were you seemed very mentally alert. Very, um, I, I was like a, a shit show at that point in the race, <laughs> 80 miles out. So I was expecting a different interaction, and you were barely uh, on top of it. So, uh, yeah, but good. I I was just curious because, like, I I want to be respectful of the race. I want to be respectful of your experience that. of the race. No, I and, appreciate and, that. And didn't want to interfere. Uh, but I also, you know, from my own personal experience, having Luke Conlon come out ride with me for 10, 20 miles. I don't remember. Um, it was a big mental boost. So I was yeah. thinking, I was like, I want to go and take a few pictures, say hi and give you a little mental boost, hopefully. And, and, and wish you luck as you, uh, rode on to the finish. I was um, good, good, good. All right. Well, listen, good job. I mean, I, honestly, man, I'm, I'm very, uh, respectful of the effort that you put down. I know this is your first like real kind of long ultra bike packing event. Um, you didn't have a lot of, you know, people out there that you could measure your success against. And I'm not sure if that matters to you, but as a dot watcher, as a fan of the sport, uh, especially a fan of this route being in my hometown, I was, continually very surprised and uh happy for you um and, and then when i when, when i met it met you uh on the route 80 miles from the finish seeing your demeter seeing the speed you were can, carrying and uh just i i, I don't know I, i'm very happy for you is the best I way i can say it fantastic how are you feeling about yourself i feel really good I feel really good. I just need to, you know, recover and pick my training back up, be um, disciplined and consistent moving toward uh, Arkansas High Country Race. So what are you going to do uh, to prepare for that event? Just uh, regular training. Uh, if I get a long weekend, maybe try to get up there and ride some of the course. Yeah. Um, but, you know, nothing, nothing, um, nothing special. I, I know – a lot of the course, I feel like I've already been on some of the more um, uh, complicated, soul-sucking parts of the course already. Yeah. Uh, that's what intimidated me into dropping, you know, before uh, it started last year. So um, I'm really well acquainted, especially with the Washita Mountains part of it. And um, just just keep keep training, keep perfecting my gear. And, um, yeah, nothing. Will special. you, uh, will you ride the Warbird? You think, uh, pr maybe so I'm, I'm looking at maybe a new Warbird frame or, uh, the storm chaser running it geared. I'm investing. Uh, things coming. I haven't looked at that bike yet. I mean, obviously with the, uh, mid South race, uh, big launch and all that, the single speed, uh, what what is different between that and the warbird that would make you want to make that change it can run a little bit bigger tire it can run uh, a 50, it can run a 50 tire it has the ability to route the um the brake cables and the and the um, dynamo cable up through the the fork into the frame yeah which my my bike right now like my um my bottle cages they're on the mounts they're put on there with electrical tape right it's it's ghetto which <laughs> it's, it works it's mine and but if i can get into a little bit better frame that fits me a little better i really need a 57.5 and what i have now the 56 if i can make it work i may be on a different frame with my same components okay so you're pretty happy with where you're at and just making some tweaks basically right. to right your setup right. yeah right. just honing it exactly what about climbing uh i i had the opportunity to go and do 150 miles on the arkansas high country route yeah and it was hard yeah that's the best way to put it um i didn't bring near enough gears 
put it simply, I was completely unprepared for the steepness of those hills, the mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you training for that? Well, I think there's no way to replicate it unless you go up there and do it. Um, there's no, there are no hills around here. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. That, like that's that. why I'm asking. Yeah, I should preface that by saying we live in Texas where I told uh, – how many feet elevation did you do in the 500 miles? Do you know? Oh, it's like 15,000 feet. 15,000. Okay. So whenever I did the 150 miles with uh, Brandon Pack at Fayetteville when they brought me out to do the little preview ride, we did 15,000 feet in 150 miles. No, that, that's and that's the standard. That's what you're going to get in Arkansas High Country Route. Right. right. I've, I've done that. I've, I've ridden that. I mean, I, I used to live in in Arkadelphia, about an hour from Washtenaw Mountains. And all of those races in Washtenaw Mountains, the OGG, the Slobberknocker, the Winona, you're going to get at least, I mean, almost exactly 10 to 1 ratio like you're talking about yeah it's a booger man i wish you luck. i hope hopefully uh you're you're able to do that and get out there on june 6th i hope so i look forward to seeing you yeah hey let me ask you a question how old are you 56 you are 56 years old and i'm sorry to put that on blast but that that is so uh encouraging to to me and i hope other people as well that you can accomplish and take on some really physical and mental challenges even you know later on life and i've I've had this theory based on basically how russell uh but how russell didn't even pick up a mountain bike until he was 57 yeah and he's done the tour divide six times. It's like it get I got it gives me hope. It's like take care of your body, you know, uh, keep keep it in motion, and you can keep doing this for a long, long time. Like this you're not in this uh, lesson a long time ago with the College yeah. Station guys on, in, in cycling. When I moved to College Station in 2005, I started riding with the the group there. And I quickly found out that it, when cycling, age is, in, in, in many respects, just a number. And there were yeah. guys I rode with that were older than me. Uh, Willie Allen, who's a, a college station cyclist. Uh, Steve Gostaitis, uh Chris Menzel, I think is about my age. Those guys will rip your legs off, man. They're strong. And they never apologize. They never say anything about age. They never say anything about I'm old or never say anything about right. I need an allowance for this, or I need somebody to cut me a break. They were leaders and very accomplished, tough, tough guys. And I learned from them, hey, don't make excuses. You may be a little older, but you can um, offset that with some experience and smart training. And uh, I learned a long time ago, just age is just a number. You just your function of your, your training and your heart and your mind. What about Jose Bermudez? How old Bermudez, is he? He's, he's, he's about five or six years younger than I am. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I but still, I mean, that's I mean, not, how, not how many 50 to 60 year olds do you see out riding their bike 500 miles or Jose many, Bermudez? But, doing? but the ones that are, are harder than woodpecker lifts. There you go. i love it (laughs) well keep on keeping on man i'm a big fan of what you've done on the grand gravel and i'm looking forward to seeing what you have coming uh hopefully our paths cross at the arkansas high country and i'm there um but yeah thank you for taking the time to chat with us and share your experience you're welcome thanks for having me we'll see you on the trails buddy thanks patrick take care bro Okay, everybody, thank you for tuning in, and thanks to Mark for coming on the show and uh, having a chat, taking us through your experience this year as the solo finisher of the Grand Gravel 500. I don't know about y'all, but I am starting to get a little stir-crazy. I've picked up 37 new hobbies. I ordered a stick-and-poke tattoo set. I plan on looking like an ex-con by the time I get out of quarantine. Planted a garden, 
taking online photography classes, started Muay Thai, uh, boxing or whatever it is. I don't even know. But uh, And I even went for an indoor trainer ride, which I haven't done in a very long time. But hang in there, folks. This too shall pass, and we'll all get to ride our damn bikes one day together. Until then, be safe, stay well. See you next week. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day or maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your bars, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You left that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes.